Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer before the Bible study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We're asking, Lord, that you open our eyes of understanding, that we will understand your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, give us knowledge, give us wisdom, give us enlightenment, and give us the boldness and the courage to declare your truth and to live out your word without compromise in any of our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we are coming to Mark chapter 6. Our learning study from verse 14 all through to verse 29. Let me read a few of the verses to you at the beginning. Mark chapter 6, verse 14. And King Herod heard of him, that he is of Christ, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. And therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, Elijah. And others said that it is a prophet as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. As we look at the word tonight, we need to understand once again that reading the word, studying the word, learning the word from the word will produce positive results when we learn with a purpose. We're not just coming because we've always come and because it's our duty to come. We want to learn something. Today we're learning about John the Baptist and we're learning about Herod, learning about Herodias, learning about the daughter of Herodias. What took place among them? What actually happened before they did what they did to John the Baptist? Before I go into the story, I want to remind you that we learn to be wise learn to be wise you look at the story you look at the record you look at what happened and you look at what john said and you look at the consequence and you become wiser learn to be wise number two is to learn to walk you're learning to walk in the way of the lord and you will meet with many circumstances and situations and yet as you meet with those circumstances what do i do how do I walk? What do I say? You learn to be wise. You learn to walk in the ways of the Lord. You learn to be watchful. Situations may come similar to what we have read, similar to what we have studied, and then you want to be watchful. Should I follow after that example of John? Or should I withdraw myself from that situation you'll be watchful. you consider all the areas of Scripture that deals with what you are confronted with. Number four, you learn to weigh your words when you talk to people and your action. Many things will take place in your community. A herald has married Herodias. A Nebuchadnezzar has dreamed a dream. Another one has done something. You read about it, you hear about it. What should I do? Should I confront him? Should I tell him 
what John told Herod, you weigh your words before you speak them because of the consequence. Not only that, you learn to wait and think through. You learn to wait. Even in the church, something has happened. A wedding has taken place. Even in the church, somebody has married another person. And then you are hearing this happen and that happened at the reception. You don't just jump into the middle of the situation. You wait and think through before you speak. You learn to withhold, rebuke from the corner. Here is this corner. If I talk to him, it's not going to change. It's not going to repent. It's going to take that word I tell him, throw it back at me, and then throw something more back at me. Therefore, you learn to withhold rebuke from this corner. You learn to withdraw from the wicked. And so, as we come to the story today, and we learn about what Herod did, what Herodias thought, and what the daughter of Herodias did, and what eventually culminated into the death of John the Baptist. You want to make sure that you learn something from what we are doing today, and God will make you wise. I will be wise. God will make us, all of us, wise in Jesus' name. Look at Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, I'm reading from verse 11. Psalm 19, verse 11. Moreover, by them, by the reading of the word, by the teaching of the word, by the study of the word, by them is the servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. We're coming to Romans chapter 15. And I'm reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 15. We're reading here from verse 4. It tells us in verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning. This story about Herod, about Herodias, and about the consequence of the exhortation that John the Baptist gave unto Herod is being recorded for you and for me. Whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. We're coming back to Psalm, Psalm 39. In Psalm 39, we're reading from verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. How wicked was Herod? Terribly wicked and incomprehensibly wicked. And yet he was, uh, you know, going to do this publicly. And John saw that. And now what should I do? Should I talk to him? That wicked Herod, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Again, I pray the Lord make all of us wise in Jesus' name. You just said that your boss has done something. And that thing he has done is a terrible thing. He shouldn't have done that. But he's a boss. He's a political leader. Is somebody high there? He has authority and power, and he can do and undo. Should I confront him personally? Should I talk to him personally? The Lord will give you wisdom. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7. He that reproved his corner getteth to himself shame. And he that rebukes a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not his corner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man. That's why we're here tonight, 
I have wise people before me. The Lord will give you instruction. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet be wiser. You'll be wiser in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 3. In Second Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading here from verse 5. Second Timothy chapter 3. We're reading from verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. There are people who are religious. There are people who are traditional. There are people who have superficial acceptance of the word of God. And then you think they're going to hear everything you have to say. They deny the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with seas, led away with diverse laws, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They are learning. Maybe they are even attending our church. And they are attending for many years, five years, seven years, ten years. They are not born again. And they have been attending for so many years, ever learning, ever learning, and yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth of experiential salvation. Watch before you go ahead. It tells us in um, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and I'm reading here from verse 9. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. The things you have learned and the things you are learning every time you come to the Bible study, every time you hear the word of God and it enlightens you. When the situation comes, in your home, in your family, in your place of work, in your college, in a community. When the situation comes to apply what you have learned, don't forget the word of God. Do it. And the God of peace shall be with you. The God of peace shall be with you. Matthew chapter 7. I read from verse 6. Matthew chapter 7, we're reading from verse 6. It tells us there in verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pills before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. I want to remind you that Jesus was here on earth when John the Baptist was here on earth. Actually, it was six months apart. That means after six months that John the Baptist was born, Christ was born. And so Jesus was still alive. And Jesus knew what Herod had done. But Jesus said nothing. Jesus knew everything that John knew about Herod. And Jesus was quiet, silent. John spoke to Herod directly. He wasn't just preaching in the open air by River Jordan. And then he said what he said, like what we're preaching now. We're preaching to everybody. But if you take that and you go to an individual directly after he has done what he has done, that's a different thing. And so the person that received the word was impenitent. And the impeccable ministry of John came to an end. Tonight we're looking at the message, an improper marriage that terminated an important ministry. 
an improper marriage that terminated an important ministry. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the holy, righteous preacher with an enduring message. The holy, righteous preacher, that's John, with an enduring message. Point number two, Herod's revengeful passion after an evil marriage. Herod's revengeful passion after an evil marriage. Number three, the heavenly revealed place by our eternal maker. John died. Where did he go? Eventually Herod died. Herodias died. Even the daughter of Herodias. She's not alive today. She also died. They all died. Where did they go? The heavenly revealed place by our eternal maker. Point number one is talking about John. John the Baptist, the holy, righteous preacher with an enduring message. We come back to Mark chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 14. Mark chapter 6 verse 14. And King Herod heard of him. For his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John, whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Verse 18, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Look at verse 20. For Herod feared John. Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy. John was a just man, justified, forgiven, cleansed, transformed, a just man, and unholy, a holy man as well, and observed him. Herod observed John. And when Herod heard John, when he heard him, he did many things. He tried to remove a pebble there and remove a speck there and do some little thing there when he heard John. And he heard him gladly, heard him gladly until the marriage situation came. As we talk about John, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, the message from the Lord. The message from the Lord. Number two, his manner of life. How was John? How did he live? His manner of life. Number three, his motive in life. The message, the manner, and the motive in life. Come to the message. This was an enduring message. It didn't originate with John. It had been before. That's why this point one is the holy, righteous preacher with an enduring message. This message that he gave concerning marriage, how do we say it's an enduring message? One, it was before Christ. Two, even at the time of Christ. And three, after Christ. That means as you divide time into three segments, the time, the period before Christ, that's the message. And at the time of Christ, that's the message. And after the time of Christ, after you went to heaven, that same message, an enduring message. How was it before Christ came? We're looking at Leviticus. In Leviticus, we're looking at 
chapter 20 and verse 21, chapter 20 of Leviticus. And we're reading from verse 21. So we know what it was before Christ came. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 21. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. That's what John was telling Herod. It's unclean. It's defiling. It's an abomination. It is evil. It's a great transgression. If a man shall take his brother's wife, it's an unclean thing. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall die childless. Look at chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. Reading here from verse 20. 18 verse 20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife. Your brother, your neighbor, your friend, co tenant, you will not lie carnally with their wife to defile thyself with her. We're coming to Proverbs chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 27. Proverbs chapter 6, reading from verse 27. It says in verse 27, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burnt? So he that goes in to his neighbor's wife, brother's wife, friend's wife, co-tenant's wife, landlord's wife, tenant's wife, so he that goes in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. And then he tells us in verse 32, he will, in verse 32, but whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth each destroyeth his own soul. And so before John and before Christ, that message had been there. And the message remains the same at the time of Christ. We're looking at Mark. When Christ came, here is the same thing. He emphasized that God is God. He has not changed. And Jesus did not come to change the word of God concerning righteousness and holiness in Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 6. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male singular and female singular. For this cause shall a man singular leave his father singular and mother singular and cleave to his wife singular. And they twain, one man, one wife, they twain shall be one flesh. They'll be so joined together, nothing to sever them. So then, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore? God has joined together. Let no man put asunder. That was the message at the time of Christ. Luke chapter 16. We're reading from verse 18. Luke 16 verse 18. Whosoever, Herod, anyone, whosoever, high or low, whosoever, a church man, or somebody who doesn't come to church, whosoever puts away his wife and marries another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marries her that is put away from her husband, committeth adultery. That means even if Philip put away the wife, and now Herod married her, both of them 
have committed adultery. Before Christ, that was the message. At the time of Christ, that was the message. After Christ went to heaven, look at what the message is. It remains the same. After Christ had come and gone, Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 2, For the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. If Philip is still alive, Herodias belonged to her. And Herod should not have taken her. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. That's after death. Only death can patch husband and wife. If they are properly married, one man, one wife, the wife had never married another one, the husband had not, never married another one, and they are joined together, they remain together till death. Verse 3. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no more, she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man after the death of the husband. And so, that's the message. As we look at John, what was his manner of life? Let's come back to uh, Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 20. Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 20. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man. That was his manner of life. And holy, the grace of God was in his life. And he had become just, forgiven, free, and set at liberty from sin. And he wasn't living in any secret sin, any common sin, any uncommon sin. His life was righteous. He was just and, and holy. He was an holy man. And Herod observed him. Herod looked at every area of his life, and his uh, servants came to bring him the information. We know that man. In the crowd, we'll see him. In the private, we'll see him. Personally, alone, we'll see him. When we saw the people, we'll see him. We have observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Look at the testimony of Jesus concerning John. It tells us in John, Gospel according to John, chapter 5, verse 33. John, chapter 5, verse 33. He said unto John, and he bear witness of the truth. Always bearing witness of the truth. Verse 35, it was a burning and a shining light. That's who a preacher should be. John was a burning and a shining light. He enlightened the people. And was fervent before the people. And when he stood for righteousness, he stood firmly. He wasn't wobbling. He wasn't compromising. He was a burning and a shining light. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. John was holy and righteous. A shining and a burning light. A faithful witness to Christ. Courageous, consecrated. He was free from the tradition of the Pharisees. Never compromise with the Pharisees. That was his manner of life. No compromise with evil. No compromise with tradition. No compromise with sinful religion. No compromise with false worship. No compromise with the elders of traditional religion, the Pharisees. The message is message from the Lord. The manner is manner of life. His motive 
is motive in life. What was he in ministry? What did he understand by the calling of the Lord upon his life? Look at Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 15. Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, that's John, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, that's John, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, that's John, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. That was his manner of life. And that was his motive in life. It was not to compromise with sinners. It wasn't to entertain sinners. It wasn't to just dine and eat with sinners. He was to preach the word to them so that the word will convict them and they'll be converted. Verse 17, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias with the attitude ability and the courage of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That was his calling. That was his calling. And he kept to that calling. Matthew chapter 21 reading from verse 32 in verse 32 here is what the lord said about him for john came unto you in the way of righteousness his messages emphasized righteousness his life emphasized righteousness his interactions emphasize righteousness his outlook everything emphasize righteousness for John came unto you in the way of righteousness and ye believed him not but the publicans and the harlots believed him when John told the harlots and the publicans the tax collectors and the evil people in society that the axe is laid to the root of the tree and every tree that does not bring forth good fruit shall be cut down and thrown into the fire they believed and they repented the publicans and the hallows and ye the pharisees when ye had seen it repented not at all that ye might believe him Look at John, chapter 1, verse 29. John, chapter 1, verse 29. While he preached repentance, he also preached redemption. Redemption that comes through the blood of the Lamb that will be slain, will be a substitute for the sins of the world, sinners in the world. John, chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John said Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was telling them, you cannot save yourself. Yes, you must repent, and then you have to believe on him. He is the Savior. Chapter 3 of John. John chapter 3, verse 27. John chapter 3, verse 27. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. I am not the Savior. I'm a preacher. I'm a forerunner to the Christ, to the Savior. And I'm pointing the way to you for you to be saved. But that I am saved before him. He that has the bride is the bridegroom. 
but the French of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. Vastachi, he must increase, but I must decrease. He, the Christ, the Savior, the Lord, the Redeemer, must increase, but I must decrease. Before we leave that point, we need to point out something that is point one. Before we leave point one, Herod eventually killed him. Oh, you see, that means that Herod was able to cut short his life, his dream, his goal, his destination. Come to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Reading from verse 24. Acts 13 verse 24. When John at first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. He actually succeeded in preaching to all the people of Israel. And as John, tell me the next word there. Tell me out aloud. If you want to fulfill your ministry, I said, tell me. As John fulfilled his course, you will finish before you go. You fulfill what God has appointed for you before you go in Jesus' name. So don't have any doubt in your mind. Look at John. Look at what happened to him. And then all that he should have done, he did all he should have done. And you will do all you should have done. As John fulfilled his cause, he said, Whom think ye that I am? I am not he, but behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to lose. For well, St. John, his message, his manner of life, and his motive in life. Let's see now, point number two. Herod's revengeful passion after an evil marriage. We're coming to Mark chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 17. Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 17. In verse 17, for Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Verse 18, for John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore, in verse 19, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him for she could not. The sin, the evil, and the wickedness came that was uh, recorded here took place after John had instructed, exhorted, and warned Herod, Herodias, and anyone connected with that kind of reckless life but they abandoned themselves to evil and there was no fear of God in them John had given the message and instead of trembling at the message they decided that John would be imprisoned number one no fear of God 
Number two, no respect for society. Actually, the whole of the nation took John as a prophet. And the Pharisees were even afraid to touch him or to answer any question about him that Jesus posed to them because all men counted him a prophet. But Herod, Herodias, as well as the daughter of Herodias, had no respect for society. Number three, no value placed on human life. No value on human life. They just did what they wanted, and they felt if a John was standing in their way, since they didn't have any value for human life, they wanted they took the life. Number four, no thoughts of future judgment. Whatever we do today has a future consequence. And whatever crime anyone commits today has a future judgment. But they were not thinking of that. They had no thoughts of future judgment. No consideration for right thinking guests. There was a birthday party. And then there were guests invited. And some of those guests would be right thinking. But they didn't have any consideration for right thinking guests. After the daughter danced, Herod promised her, Ask me any sin up to half of my kingdom, and I will give it unto you. The question is, are the human beings Herod's property? No. Was John part of his kingdom? No. Was Christ part of his kingdom? No. Are the preachers of righteousness and the preachers of the eternal truth part of his kingdom? No. And the people that were there, if they were right thinking, they would have known that John shouldn't have been taken. It's not part of the kingdom, but Herod did not have any consideration for right thinking guests. And Herod had no control over his passion. Herodias had no control over her passion. And because they had no control, many things will happen in life. You've done something right or wrong, and somebody confronts you, even if he says what you don't like, there should be control over your passion. You don't fly at that, get angry at that, and then do something criminal just because somebody confronted you and they had no conscience for right or wrong. They didn't have any conscience for right or wrong. That's why they did what they did. As you look at this section, Herod's revengeful passion after an evil marriage, three things. Number one, Herod's hateful, revengeful passion. Herod's hateful, revengeful passion. Look at verse 21 of Mark chapter 6. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper for his laws, to his laws, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced, and pleased Herod, and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give each thee, and he swear unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give each thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and asked her mother, what a mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. She had been waiting for that opportunity for a long time. And now the chance came. What am I going to ask? Do I ask for lunch? 
We don't need land. Thou ask for a house. We don't need a house. Do I ask for a city to be named after you or after me? We don't need all that. Do I ask for gold or silver? No, not at all. Do I ask for the building of a hospital, the building of something that will serve society? No, we don't need that. The only thing we need, which we are not going to use, which is not going to be profitable to us, is the head of John the Baptist. How far hatred can go? How far animosity can go? How far crime can go? And she came in straight way with haste unto the king before the king changed his mind and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Sorry, but he didn't change. Sorry, but he didn't repent. Sorry, he didn't turn away from the crime. Sorry, he didn't turn away from the evil. How many people, when they see the consequence of what they have done, they put a stumbling block, a stumbling stone before somebody, and that person broke his arm by falling over that stumbling stone. They feel sorry, but they don't confess. They feel sorry, but they don't repent. They feel sorry, but they still continue putting stumbling blocks and stumbling stones before people. When they have done something, and they have seen that that sin made another person to get into danger, calamity, and uh, that person's life is endangered. They may feel sorry, but there's no change. Such people are not saved. Such people are like Herod. The king was exceeding sorry, yet for his own sake and for the sake for the sakes which of the people that such was him, he would not reject her. Understand, sin is sin, and sin is to be repented of. If you make an oath, if you make a covenant, and then you discover that oath and that covenant is sinful, is evil, is destructive, is criminal, you have to repent of that oath. If you made a covenant and then you discovered that covenant is evil, is sinful, and it will bring judgment upon you, you repent of that covenant. If you made a promise, you promise somebody, I'll do this, I'll do that, and you discover that that promise is going to result in evil. You repent of that promise. You will not say, I'm a man of my word. I'm a woman of my word. I discovered the promise I made is wrong. It's a crime. It's going to injure somebody. It's going to offend God. But because I'm a man of my word, I still must do it. No, you don't have to. You will repent. And if it's an act, behavior, character, anything that is sinful, you're supposed to repent. But we're told, verse 26, and the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his own sake, and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an ex executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison. Number one, Herod's hateful, revengeful passion. In uh, Proverbs chapter 15, Proverbs chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 12. Proverbs 15, verse 12. His corner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither 
will he go unto the wise? Herod had been angry. Herod had been offended since John told him the truth. And because of the hatred he nursed in the heart, as the opportunity came now, he took a revenge. Number two, Herodias, hostile, retaliatory pursuit. Herodias, hostile, retaliatory pursuit. She had been pursuing this kind of thing. It was a thought in her heart. It was a plan and a plot. It was a conspiracy. I must do something to this John. He spoke against my marriage. He spoke against my getting to Herod and marrying him. Look at chapter 6 of Mark. Mark chapter 6. And we're reading from verse 19. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him. I must ask you, what quarrel, what offense, what anger, what malice, and what hateful, repulsive, retaliatory thing do you have in your heart against the preacher of truth? Why are you angry? He wants you to get to heaven. Why are you angry? He wants you to escape hell. Why are you angry? He wants your life to be pleasing unto God. Why are you angry? He's teaching you to turn. Turn away from your evil. Why are you angry? Why are you like Herodias? Repent. You are the one to repent. The truth is the truth. And the truth was there before you were born. And the truth will remain after you are gone. The truth is enduring, eternal. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him. Why? What's the matter? What's so serious? Would have killed him. He has a ministry to the whole of Israel and she would have killed him to stop that ministry to the whole of the nation. Why? Because of an evil marriage? Why? Because of being warned against sin? Why? Because of trying to save you out of perdition, out of eternal judgment. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him. I would have killed him, but could not. They will not. You'll not be able to touch your life. Until your time comes, nobody will touch your life in Jesus' name. She could not. She could not. She could not. Look at Romans chapter 14. I read from verse 12. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. So then... Every one of us will give account of himself to God. Whatever you are angry at, every one of us shall give account of himself. You're angry against John, against the holiness preacher, against the preacher emphasizing repentance, so you can be saved. So then, every one shall give account of himself unto God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 14. Tells us in chapter 12, verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment, every work of anger. Every action of hatred, every action of hostility, every action of conspiracy, every action of his corner, 
because of the rebu rebuke, so for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, every secret plot, every secret plan, every secret conspiracy, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Job chapter 31. In Job chapter 31, reading from verse 14, Job such a one reading from verse 14 it says what then shall I do when God rises up and when he visiteth what shall I answer him did not he that made me in the womb make him Elders, think about that. The angry person that wants to kill and destroy another person. The one that gives you breath is the one that gives him breath, gives her breath. The one that is keeping you alive is the one that is keeping her, keeping him alive. The one that gave you life is the one that gave him, that gave her life. And as you treasure your own life, Treasure the lives of other people. Did not he that made me in the womb make him? And did not one fashion us in the womb? Let's come back to Mark chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 22. Mark chapter 6, verse 22. A horrible, repulsive perversion. That's the daughter now who was talking about Herod. Herod's hateful, revengeful passion. Who was talking about Herodias, Herodias hostile, retaliatory pursuit. Now about the daughter. A horrible, repulsive perversion. In verse 22, and when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, the daughter of Herodias, ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he swear unto her, Herodias, daughter, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it unto thee to the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, like mother, like daughter, like daughter, like mother, she shared the hatred, she shared the hostility and she became a horrible personality herself. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. No question. What should I ask for that? Is that not killing another person? Will there not be judgment? Would there not be a consequence? And she came in straight away without thinking, without turning it over, and without having any feeling for human life and for the pain John the Baptist will have. And she came in with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. She had perversion. She had evil. She had a corrupted heart. Jeremiah chapter 18. Young people understand whatever you do will be examined by God. If it is evil, judgment will also come. The judgment comes upon everyone young and old. 
tells us in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 13, Therefore thus says the Lord, Ask ye now among the heathen who has heard such things. The virgin of Israel has done a very horrible thing. Horrible thing. Something that shouldn't be done. The mother touched the child, and the child carried it out. Horrible. Ezekiel chapter 22, reading from verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 14. Can thine heart endure, or can thine hand be strong in the days when I shall deal with thee? Herod, Herodias, and the daughter, when the day of reckoning comes, when the day of judgment comes, when every evil they are done will be required of them, can their hearts endure? Can their hands be strong in the days that God will deal with them? I, the Lord, have spoken it and will do it. Judgment is coming, all will be there. And the only way of escape is to turn and to repent now. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But whosoever continues sinning, Without thinking of the day to repent, the final end will come, judgment will come. Isaiah chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 9. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Verse 11. And I will punish the world for their evil. Herod, Herodias, daughter of Herodias, and all people that continue in evil without repenting. They'll rather get rid of the preacher of repentance than repent. Judgment day is coming. I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Verse 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall be removed out of her place. And in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, in the day of his fierce anger. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We're reading from verse 9. In Ecclesiastes 11, verse 9, it says, Rejoice, O man. Rejoice, O woman, in thy youth. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. And walk in the ways of of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes but know thou whatever you do you want to dance you want to celebrate you want to play gambling you want to do whatever evil thing other young people are doing know this that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Judgment day is coming. Only those who repent and are saved will escape the judgment of God. 
reckoning day coming and coming very soon. We're coming back to Mark chapter 6, verse 29, point number 3 now. The heavenly revealed place, the final place, by our eternal maker. We're looking at Mark chapter 6, verse 29. And when his disciples heard of it, the beheading of John, the disciples heard, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. Come to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verse 12. Matthew 14, verse 12. And his disciples came and took up his body and buried it. You understand? They dug the earth. They put the body in the earth. And they closed it up. They buried the body and went and told Jesus. Think about that. The burial that takes place after death. Why is the body consigned to the earth? Scientists tell us what the Bible also tells us. The 16 elements we find in the body, we also find in the soil. And so the major part of the body of man is all dust and water. And so, when the body is dead, that's dust, and it goes back to the dust from where it came. Ecclesiastes, we're looking at chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the dust as it was. That's the body. Is buried, it returns to the dust, but man has a soul, man has a spirit. Look at that verse 7. And the spirit shall return unto God that who gave it. The spirit is not buried, the soul is not buried, but is the body that is buried, and the spirit returns unto God. Verse 14, for God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 21. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21, who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward? The spirit of man when, man, when a man dies, the body goes down, but the spirit goes upward. And the spirit of the beast that goes downward to the earth, that is the animal, the dog, the goat, the hen, whatever, when they die, their bodies will go down. Everything within them will go down. But for man, who knows the spirit of man that goes upward? It tells us in Job chapter 34, the body goes down to the grave. The spirit goes up unto the Lord. Job chapter 34. We're reading from verse 14. Job 34, verse 14. Here it says, If he set his heart upon man, if he gather unto himself his spirit and his breath, when he sets his heart upon a man, and he says his days are done on earth, he gathers the spirit unto himself. All flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again unto dust. 
the body will turn back to dust, but the spirit will be gathered unto the Lord. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, we're reading from verse 59. The spirit goes up, the spirit goes to God, but the body goes to the ground. Chapter 7 of Acts, verse 59. And the stone Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He had looked up to heaven, and he saw Jesus Christ standing up in heaven. And he said, receive my spirit. His spirit went up. How about his body? Chapter 8, verse 2. Chapter 8, verse 2. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. The body went back to the ground, but the spirit went to God. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. As it is appointed unto men wants to die, and then their body will go to dust, will go to the grave, but after this, the judgment, their soul will go to God, and there will be judgment. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 2 and verse 3. Daniel chapter 12, reading from verse 2. It says in verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth, that is when somebody dies, the body goes to the grave in the dust of the earth. It's like sleeping shall awake on the day of a judgment reckoning some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever any amen from the church? John the Baptist turned many unto righteousness and he'll be shining forever and ever. Herod, Herodias, and the daughter, they were evil, they were wicked, they were buried after they died. They'll rise up to everlasting contempt and shame. I pray that will not be your Lord in Jesus' name. We're looking at Revelation chapter 20. I read from verse 11. Revelation chapter 20. We're reading from verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, great Herod, great Herodias, and small young damsel, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. What does that mean? When somebody dies now, the body goes to the grave. But the soul, if it's a sinner, goes to hell. But on the day of reckoning, on the day of resurrection, the body will rise up from the grave. The spirit will come from where it's um, suffering. 
and the body, soul, and spirit will join together, and then the whole man will now face the final judgment. Death and hell delivered up the dead which joined them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the second level, the second kind, the second degree of death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I pray that will not be your Lord. But you must be born again. If that will not be your Lord, you must turn away from sin and come to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you are a compromiser in your office, a compromiser at home, a compromiser everywhere, you cannot stand for the truth and you cannot stand for your salvation. You are backsliding, 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 and now you are even a corrupter of other people. The final day will come, and whosoever was not found reaching in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. But those who are children of God, those who are overcomers, and those who abide and remain until the coming of Christ, heaven is your Lord. Heaven is your goal. I will be there. We shall be there together in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 2 verse 7. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to each of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You will be there. It's going to prepare a place for you. I pray you will not miss that place. If you have done any evil, the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart. We don't know when Christ will come. And we don't know when you are going to leave the earth. You have your chance today. Repent. Turn to the Lord. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All your sins will be forgiven. And it will give you the power to go and sin no more. And when that reckoning day comes, thank God we shall be in heaven together in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. We need to take everything we have learned to the Lord in prayer. Let's not be forgetful hearers. The Lord has spoken to us. He loves you. He doesn't want you to uh, perish. You will not perish. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. <laughs> 